Time Attack Podcast, a podcast about the most exciting form of no holds barred motorsport known to this universe. Thank you, Chris Diggles, and welcome back to the World Time Attack Challenge Off the Record Podcast. Today, I'm joined, as always, by World Time Attack CEO and my co-host, Ian Baker, and a very special guest that needs no introduction in the world of World Time Attack, Warren Luff. Warren, how are you? Good, mate. Thanks for having me here, guys. No worries. Thanks for being with us, mate. So if you know anything about World Time Attack Challenge, you would have seen Warren in his prime in behind the driver's seat or uh, you would have seen him walking around the pits with uh, un- undoubtedly World Time Attack's best head of hair. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's take it back, Warren. Um, you've been in and around World Time Attack since its inception, basically. So, Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. Luffy was the highest placed... Australian in the first ever World Time Attack driving the Jenny 3 Lotus. There you go. So let's yeah. rewind back to those times. Let's, yeah. let's take it back to its genesis, mate. Let's, let's talk about the first time you ever stepped into Ian Baker's event <laughs> and where the magic started from there. Well, look, obviously, uh, look, Baker and I, we go back a long way and uh, obviously well before World Time Attack and everything. But, um, yeah, those early days of World Time Attack and uh, and the opportunity to sort of come along. And, uh, yeah, the first time there was obviously in the Lotus Exige and uh, Angela, who owned the, the Lotus, I'd driven with that car a few times in uh, Australian GT rounds and, and shared the car with him. And, um, and then they rang me and said, hey, we're thinking about taking it to World Time Attack. Do you want to uh, come along and have a drive? So, of course, my answer is always going to be yes to, to something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like obviously it was in that first sort of uh, in those very early years and uh, and in those grounding days. But um, yeah, like the Lotus was a lot of fun. It was uh, I think that first year was like as Ian said, were the highest place Aussie first. Uh, fourth outright and um, it's always just been such a great event to be a part of it's something that's so unique in motorsport because so many other levels of motorsport it's so controlled and there's so many regulations and rules and yes there's rules and regulations within world time attack but it's sort of as I say to people the the basis of world time attack is if you can think it and you can dream it yeah. you can pretty much all build it and race it so it's uh, it's yeah I've always enjoyed my time at the event and uh, and over the years I've been obviously lucky to be there a few more times and every every time it's a, it's a great journey to come back to and uh, yeah love being part of the World Time Attack family. Awesome, awesome. Also, I might add that Lotus mm. was probably the most fitting GT car to come to our event because when you think of a GT3 car, they're normally you know manufactured by Audi or or, or Ferrari or whatever, and they're built to an absolute spec. Where that was a hot rod built by Lachlan yeah. <laughs> with a crazy big turbo. And I don't know how it was all homologated. I think they may have even changed it for our event, but it was something that a GT3 car would never normally do, and they did to that. Mm. Um, and although the base platform was built by Lotus, and and obviously you know pretty superior thing to any anything that, that anyone's going to really build. Well, back then you would think. Yeah. Um, it was sort of the fitting car because it was it was it a Toyota motor I think or yeah, I think I yeah can't, I can't even but it was remember. it was crazy all the bells and whistles you know so yeah I remember it had massive massive big turbo <laughs> yeah. huge yeah. amounts of boost like trying to get yeah trying yeah. to get traction and yeah. obviously yeah, that was sort of before Aero really started to come yeah so it was still come. running the Lotus Aero wasn't yeah, it? yeah exactly yeah. so for a GT car Do you it had what reason. time it did I think it did a one thirty one or something yeah, yeah. it was a low thirty one or a high thirty yeah or because because well, like the winning time back then was thirty although the track was slightly different the car that won the side revo did a minute 30 yeah yeah i think we were like we're three or four tenths off third place or yeah, something like yeah. that so we we're sort of like knocking on the door but yeah. um yeah it was certainly a it was a handful to drive around there i remember yeah, that yeah. much yeah. so anyway let's go back a lot further than that i actually know luffy from the like right back to his dad used to run the the training school at oran park the now defunct oran park where we started right. a super lap and um luffy sort of grew up there didn't you yeah, like it was, um, I suppose Oran Park was kind of like my second home as, yeah. a, as a kid growing up. Obviously, Dad had the driving school out there. And um, look, I remember being out there from such a young age and, and learning to drive. I think I was like seven or eight years of age. And yep. I've told the story to many people, but one of the very first times I, I was able to drive a car, it was always that sort of, that fine balance between what was going to be enough pillows and phone books <laughs> to be able to sort of see just enough over the steering wheel and sit far enough forward so you could just get to sort of full throttle and enough brake that you'd slow down for a corner. And I remember I was out there driving around and Tony Perich, who was the co-owner of Oran Park and, yep. um, and, and still a great family friend of ours, he, uh, he told the story well that he was standing in the office one day and he's looked out and saw a car go past, which of course is nothing unusual at a race circuit. But he thought that there was something a little bit unusual because he's seen this car, car go past with no driver in it. <laughs> or, or what, he, what he thought was, was no driver. Yeah. And um, 
next time around I've come onto the main straight and I still remember this image of like Tony standing in the middle of the main straight, arms waving, going hysterical, trying to like stop this driverless car. Yep. And I've like pulled up and he's like glared in the window and Tony's a reasonably large man and I'm this small kid sort of yeah. sitting in the front seat of this car and I'm sort of like looking up at him and he's looking down at me and uh, we had a bit of a chat and then he thought it was maybe a good idea to get me off the track after that. But uh, yeah, so yeah, my uh, my driving career started at a, at a very early age. So when most kids were usually out sort of kicking a kicking a footy on a weekend, I was out at Dadadoran Park sort yeah, of uh, sure. having a drive of whatever I could during the lunch break at the driving school. And then then from there, you sort of went onto the One Make series. I, I do recall like you're, you're quite successful in that too with Dean Evans and those sort of guys back in the back in the nineties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did I, the Mirage, did you do? And the, yeah, I did the Swifts? I did the Suzuki series first off in ninety five. Yeah. I think um, like my first ever race car was my little uh, RX three eight oh eight that I ran in in, um, in uh, state that level. Well, actually, funny story. I um, about five or six years ago, I was at the Bathurst Twelve Hour and um, staying at the hotel there on the track. And I've got in the lift one morning, and I've come down, and this guy's like sort of half looked at me, and I was half asleep and wasn't really paying attention. And he's like, he goes, Warren Luff. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, did you used to have a um, Mazda eight oh eight? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I own it. Wow. Oh, really? Wow. And so like this is like nearly t- just over twenty years later. Um, got chatting to him. He lived in Queensland and he's like, yeah, like he said, we went back through the logbook and he said, you were the second owner of it, which wow. was right. And he showed me a whole bunch of photos. He raced at Lakeside and it's been obviously very, very different from when I first drove it. And we had a great chat. It was good to see photos of the car. And then 12 months later, same scenario. I'm in the lift. This guy hops in, he looks at me and he goes, Warren. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, remember, I'm, I met you last year. I'm, I'm the guy that owns your 808. And I'm like, oh, cool. We get chatting. I'm like, oh, how are you going? How's the car? He goes, yeah, no good. My son shunted it at Lakeside and it's been oh, destroyed. No. So oh. like, so 20 plus years later, I find out where the car is. Unfortunately, I was never going to be in a position to buy it back. But um, yeah, then uh, 12 months after that, she's, uh, she's no more. So, um, wow. But yeah, so a lot of my early career was definitely spent in a lot of different One Make series. I obviously started off in the Suzuki did series. Did you ever do open wheel? I did. I've done two open wheel races in my life, both in New Zealand. Yeah, okay. And, oh, um, really? Yeah, so it was – and again, it's it's funny how different things have come about in, in my career and opportunities to do different drives and all that sort of stuff. And so many things have happened at the last minute. And, and it was the same. I got a phone call one time from a – from a good friend of mine who got me to go race in New Zealand after the Suzuki series. And, um, and he's like, Hey, look, there's a, there might be a chance for you to come over and, and do the formula Ford festival over here at Taupo, which was kind of sort of mirrored off the British formula yeah, Ford right, festival, yeah, obviously yeah, at, a, yep. at a much smaller level. So it was kind yep. of like their national championship. Yep. And um, I'd never raced a formula Ford, obviously again, through dad's driving school, yep. we had formula Ford. So I'd driven quite a few, went over there with no open wheel experience and managed to finish second in the first year. So Really? <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, there's always been so many different cars and different sure. one-make series and just it's been one of those journeys where there was never, right from, I suppose, when I first started racing because Dad was never in a position to sort of just spend ridiculous levels yeah. of money. So it was about the networking and meeting people and, and that's yeah. where the driving school was such a, a big driving force in my career because – being able to sort of meet some like-minded people that were maybe in a position in companies that had a passion for cars and driving and probably had a dream when they were kids to sure. be able to go racing, yeah. but they're now in a position to be able to help someone. And that's how most of my career really sort of got started is just meeting people like that that were able to sort of help out and that's how I got to go yeah. do places like Nürburgring, 24-hour spa, How many times have you done that? Uh, Nürburgring, 24-hour, I've done... I've done four 24 hour races there wow. and I've done a few um, shorter VLN races. So is Le Mans on the cards ever? Do you think? Would was love it? to. Yeah, I'm sure um, you would. Yeah. And looking towards the future with um, them now embracing, so they're getting rid of the GTE um, and they're going to go GT3, I think, from 20, 2023 right, or 2024. Okay. Um, would, look, Le Mans is still very, very high on the bucket list. Same, same as Daytona. Yep. Um, but look, it's just. Uh, wait, wait and You've see. You've got to get all the stars to a line, Exactly. Right? Yeah. Look, if the opportunity came about, I'd yep. absolutely jump at the chance. But um, as I say to so many people, the, the seven-year-old kid that used to sit on the lounge watching motorsport, yep. dreaming of racing cars, has done so much more than what I ever thought was even possible. So, so on that note, you've driven a lot of the GT cars and Career Cups. How do they all compare to each other? Like, uh, so, so a GT, you, I mean, you've driven the McLaren GT. Yep. Um, in the Bathurst 12-hour, you've driven Porsche Career Cup. How do they all compare? 
like the, the GT cars are quite interesting because obviously you've got balance of performance to try and sort yep. of equalize the performance across all the cars. So, yep. so different cars do things differently. So like the Audi, which I drove for quite a few years and um, obviously was very lucky with Audi that, um, that both Craig Lowndes and I got to go over to Nürburgring with Audi. Wow. Um, we went over there to do a, to a, do a VLN race. Yep. Unfortunately, the race didn't go quite to plan. Craig got hit in uh, qualifying by a slower car yep. and ended up having a reasonably large crash, which was super unfortunate. So race day was spent in the uh, corporate hospitality suite pouring beers and uh, <laughs> and drinking beers with the guests of Audi. But then, I went, your sorrows, yeah, right? but then I went back a year later to, to do Nürburgring 24-hour with, uh, with Audi. So the, the era of the Audi, I think most people sort of any that have had anything to do in GT racing – Realise that the Audi's probably on a on an aero side of things, probably one of the best cars it, out there. Okay, yeah. um, but the downside of the the aero on the Audi is it doesn't have the straight line speed, and that's right. probably been one of its Achilles heels in recent history at the Bathurst Twelve Hour. Yep. Is it's the fastest car in the middle sector, um, which is basically the whole yep. op- across the top of the mountain. But it's a, it's one of the slowest cars up and down the mountain. Which it's always a balancing act, though, yeah. isn't it? There's it no is. free lunch. Yeah. Whereas the McLaren is kind of the opposite. It doesn't have anywhere near the aero, so it's nowhere near as fast across the mountain as the Audi, but right. it's way faster going up and down the mountain. And all of your overtaking happens in the bottom half of the lap sure. at, uh, at Bathurst. So, uh, again, in the McLaren, you, you definitely uh, you get left for dead by the Audi across the top of the mountain, yeah. but it's a... Uh, as soon as you get to to Conrad, you can see them in your sights, and you start to sort of sort of pull them back in. So the other thing is, those GT cars now have such a lot of driver aids to make it so yeah. that the the you know the average driver, the the, the, the you know the gentleman driver, mm. can can drive it without crashing it and come within a few tenths. So does that make it any more boring for you guys that are as yeah. a professional driver or? No, it, it just it adds another layer of I suppose like anyone that's running at the front end in any category, whether it be in GT, Carrera Cup, V8 supercars, yep. or like HQs at a, yep. at a club level meet. If you're running at the front of a field, you're doing a bloody good job yeah. out there. And it's it's the same in in the GT cars. It's about trying to work out how to drive the car with with the electronic aids that you've got yeah. there. Um, yeah, fair enough. One of the, probably one of the hardest things that makes in in GT racing is because of the ABS and the ABS systems being so good. Um, like say in Carrera Cup, where you don't have you don't have ABS now in them. Um, one of the biggest differences between a pro and an am is in the braking areas because yep. the confidence of the pro driver being able to really brake to the threshold and get the most out of it. Whereas in a GT, you don't have that sort of – you don't have the worry about being – when you're an AM driver, you, if you jump on the brakes too hard, you're not going to lock it up and sort of smoke all four tyres and go firing off. Yeah. At worst, you might sort of run on a little bit through the corner. So some of the racing in the GT stuff is is quite hard because you'll catch some of the AM guys and the braking areas where you're trying to sort of throw it down the inside – some of those guys are definitely not lacking in, in fear about having a big yeah, go sure. under brake. Yeah. So um, a lot of your overtaking is usually done coming out of the corner because they'll end up either over-slowing it or understeering wide. Right. So you've got to focus on the run out sure. of the corner and get past them. But but that's the thing, the important thing with the GT racing is it is built for the amateur driver. That's, yep. that's the foundation. And it's very smart what they've done. Like Absolutely. at the end of the day, um, someone's got to pay for this. Absolutely, and, yeah. And the corporate funding is getting harder and harder to get. As, as you know, over the years, that's what it's been. But you can see it changing throughout the whole world, you know, not right from Formula One down to, right. to racing at Speedway. It's, it's basically becoming a lot more owner-orientated. It is, yeah. And, and the manufacturers have, have, done, have seen that. And it's very smart, I think, what they've done, you know. And Absolutely. I think you'll see with... Um, um, like say Le Mans 24 hour yep. going to the GT3 formula in 23 or 24, yep. you're going to see a massive field of like, yep. you could almost literally do a 24 hour race there with a field of just GT3 yep. cars. It's the, the, I feel sorry for the people that are going to have to control the selection criteria yeah, sure. because you're going to have teams from all around the world. Like for everyone, Le Mans is one of those bucket list races yeah, and, yeah. and GT is spread so, so right around the world and there's yeah. so many great championships it's going to be uh it's going to be a tough one to get in for for sure now the next thing i want to talk about is your involvement with motor magazine and you've been there like star test driver um i've seen you do some cool shit with them you know <laughs> i remember turning up one day and a luffy and he's jumping out of a black lamborghini yep. aventador and there's smoke coming off the brakes and everything like Wow, you just did some laps in that, and then, and more recently, you did a you set the lap record in a GD2 RS at, at yeah. the Motor Ben Motorsport Park. So, right. tell us about some of the good 
stuff you've done with Marty because it's a yeah. Look, it's been a it's been an amazing journey to to do the things that I have with them. So it started back in two thousand and four. Yep. And um, yeah, so seventeen odd years later, yep. I'm I'm still there and um, still get to do so many cool things and driven so many different cool cars. But What's the coolest? Tell me what is your um, like the best. If you had to pick one, yep. And then second. Uh, Look, probably, um, yeah, the Aventador was, was certainly right up there, the yep. GT2 RS. Yep. Um, I remember I remember years ago there was um, – we had a, a Murcielago in, like, the oh, Battleship yeah. Grey with the black wheels. Cool, that thing yeah. was just proper cool. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But, again, like, there's just been so many different cool cars. And then, obviously, we've done things like Hot Tuna Challenge yep. where we've had some, like, wild cars over the years. I yep. remember one of the one of – one of the nearly the biggest accidents I reckon I've ever had in my career. Was it an accident or a crash? No, well, it, it was <laughs> actually, difference. it was a near miss. It was it? So we had um, uh, one year at Hot Tuna Challenge at Sydney Motorsport Park. We had uh, some guys there that had an F6 Typhoon and it wasn't running properly. And, and the first day when we did all the drag strip stuff and everything yep. like that. So like up at the drag strip, there would have been like, I don't know, 50, 60 people and 20 odd cars. And yep. so we're up there all day. And this Typhoon just, they couldn't get it to run. They were claiming it made about 1,200 rear wheel horsepower wow. on the dyno. And so this, we knew this thing was an animal and yeah. they really wanted it to be part of the judging. So they, gave, they, they allowed them to take it away and go back to their dyno and get it sorted and all that sort of stuff. But there was some pretty strict regulations yep. that you um, that had to run on pump fuel yep. and all, all this sort of stuff. Yep. And so the next day they've come back and they're like, yep, it's good to go. Like, it's fine. Like, it'll run now because it, it wouldn't run properly on the first day. So... I remember the editor just said, look, just grab the photographer, go up to the drag strip and just see what numbers you can get out. Like, if it doesn't yeah. run properly, just don't worry about it. Mm. So uh, myself and uh, Easton Chang, the photographer, we've gone up to the drag strip and I'll, I went for a run, just just a slow drive down the drag strip and um, the amount of turbo lag on this thing was like oh, horrendous. Imagine, like, yeah, you, yeah. you put your foot on the throttle and the boost had come in like two days later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I've sort of, I've done a half run and I've come back to, and I said to Easton, I said, look, we'll just do one run and we'll see what we can get out of it. So I've like staged in the left lane and I've sort of like, sort of stalled it up, took off. And obviously it was an auto and like, once it came on boost, this thing was just yeah. out of control. Like, yeah. road tyres. Yeah, yeah. And um, like, just changing gears and like, just wheel spun the whole way oh, down yeah. the quarter mile. So I reckon we got to about the 350 metre mark and it has just hand grenaded the, oh, no. um, the radiator hose off the, off the radiator. Oh, so it's just dumped coolant straight down the left oh. side of the engine and all under the left side. So I've gone from sort of like, at, I don't know what speed we would have been doing. Like it had that much wheel spin. It was probably, I don't know. 100 bit, mile an hour or something? Yeah, probably yeah. high 100, yeah. nearly 200 k an hour. Yeah. And this thing's just snapped hard right. Oh my God. Like so... Silly me, no helmet, by the way. Oh, well, oh yeah, so, you're only doing a challenge, yeah. yeah it's okay. And um, so this thing has just snapped hard right, and I actually took out the 400 meter timing beacon. Oh, really? With the left rear tire, as oh, I've yeah. gone sideways across the middle lane, Jeez. and like I'm going straight towards the wow. wall on the right hand side, and this thing, it's just, it's finally grabbed. And it's just snapped back, and I've run completely <laughs> parallel by this stage because it's obviously hand grenaded the the radiator hose off. It's killed the engine, so I had no power steer. But in that moment of fight and flight, you've these arms have never had yeah, so yeah. much strength in all their <laughs> yeah, life. I bet. Yeah, yeah. And I've straightened the thing up and literally ran dead parallel with the wall. Like wow. I was actually like I braced myself waiting for the impact, and just coasted the thing all the way down. I had to get out the passenger side of the car because I was that close to the wall. Had a bit of a knee tremble. I'm like, whoa, that was pretty interesting. But you didn't clip it? No, I didn't clip the wall. Wow. We, anyway, we towed it back and um, and I'm like, oh, look, this thing, like, forget <laughs> yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for whatever reason, I don't know, like, by this stage, there's we're back in the pit area at Sydney Motorsport Park. There's heaps of people around. And for some reason, someone's decided to open the boot on this thing. Don't ask me why, yeah, yeah. but someone's opened the boot on this thing. <laughs> In the boot, there's a 20-litre drum of methanol, oh, oh. ratchet-strapped, and it's running methanol injection oh. through to the engine bay. Oh, my God. And I'm just like, I've just broken About out. About to a, die. I'm broken out in this cold sweat. Like, if it had gone in, it would yeah. have been like... Yeah, terminal. Would, oh, yeah. It would have been not and nice. And an invisible flame, too. So exactly. Right. So... Uh, so, yeah, those guys got excluded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I want to know about your magazine days, I've worked in magazines myself, and jumping into different cars as you would have as a, as a test driver, was there any car that changed your perception? Like you went in going, I don't think I'm going to like that, jumped in and really, really enjoyed it? Um, yeah, look, there's been so many different cars that have been big surprises over the years. Like, um, And it's not 
with with cars that get your attention like that, it's never it's never the Porsches, it's never the the Lambos or Ferraris or, or, you or expect stuff like them that. To be you, like that. You know they're going to yeah, be good and all yeah. that. It's more it's more some of the smaller stuff, um, some of the little hot hatches and and some of the fun stuff where you go, you know what, that's really cool to drive. Like you actually you want to keep driving it because it's so much fun. But um, but generally, like most of the stuff that I do with them, like when we do um, whether it be performance car of the year or anything like that most of the laps that i do i usually only ever ever do two laps in the cars anyway it's basically out of the pits two flyers and that's it because again these are press cars you don't want to be sending them back with tires shredded off them and metal to metal on brakes and all that sort of stuff so um most journos do though (laughs) well yeah yeah, it kind of gets frowned upon these days unfortunately but um but yeah so it's but it's also probably helped me as a race car driver as well because it's about being able to get in a car and identify what the characteristics of that car are and how to get the best out of it so quickly. Yep. And um, so it's, it, it, for me, it's actually been a good learning tool in my racing career as well, being able to sort of do those things and all that sort of stuff. But I remember another funny story um, with the guys at Motor. When the Audi R8 first came out, I flew into Sydney and they're like, oh, look, we've got the, the new R8. It'll be waiting for you at Sydney Airport. And you would have thought it was like we are filming like a commercial because like I've, um, I've flown in on a Qantas flight and they're like, it'll be in Qantas Valet for you. So I've come down the lift. And in those days, like the Qantas Valet, as you came down where baggage was, it was off to the left. Yep. I don't know, it was a Wednesday or Thursday night, whatever it was. And as I've come down, like the whole Valet car park was almost completely empty. And you would have thought that they've angled every light in this car park At to shine car. on this bright oh, wow. red Audi R8. And this thing looked unbelievable. Like yeah. it was detailed within an inch of its yeah. life. And like the, the ground was all wet and this thing is just immaculate sitting there. And I've gone to the guy at the valet desk. Like there's one, basically one car left in the car park. And I'm like, oh, I'm here to pick up a car. And he's like, oh, what are you here to pick up? And I'm like, I'm here to get that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I was wondering who was coming to get yeah, that. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. And um, so I was actually staying at, uh, at a good mate of mine's place at Hunter's Hill, at uh, Polish's yeah. place. And um, so, of course, going from the airport across to Hunter's Hill, you've got to go for an obligatory run through the city. Yes. And I remember pulling up at a set of lights and a bunch of young guys have pulled up in a car beside me, like five young guys all hanging out of this car and they've pulled up beside me and they're like, put the window down. They're like, like waving to me and put the window down. And they're like, oh, mate, fully sick car. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, thanks, mate. And they're like, what Ferrari is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I've just kind of like looked at them. I'm like... The new one. The yeah, new yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, cool. Yeah. Welcome to Sydney. <laughs> so let's talk about V8 supercars. You've been in that for quite a few years now. Yes. Um, you've been on the podium at Bathurst a couple of times, yeah? Yeah, a few times. What, what's your, a few times, yeah. So what, what's your best experience there, do you think, if uh, you had to rate it? Yeah, look, I think um, for me, still probably that first Bathurst podium. For because, sure. again, it's that, um, as I say to people. What year was that? Was 2000, that? 2012 with Craig. Craig, yep. So, um, yeah, like it's that six and seven-year-old kid realising yeah. that lifetime dream. I was like, going to say, like a lot of these guys racing V8 supercars yeah. for their whole life and they never get a, a podium on Bathurst. That's a big deal. And you've yeah. had how many? Uh, Three? Six. Six, 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 six of them. Wow. Six. So, I actually, I actually hold the joint record for the most amount of podiums wow. without a win. Yeah, that's awesome. So, fingers crossed we can change that one. But, um, yeah, 2012, it was definitely a special time because... Be, yeah. Like the the first time you walk out onto the podium there, there's a sea of people just yelling and screaming, yeah, and it's just yeah. that it's that realization you've gone from that sort of motorsport fan that was always that one watching it yeah. and watching those guys step out on the podium and and, and dream. Craig, and Craig had a huge following oh, too, didn't he? Yeah, like, any you know? any time that you step out on the podium, yeah. and I was lucky to do that uh, two years in a row with Craig. Yep. Um, like he he is the people's champion, and yep. he is that he's that great guy. And I'm actually actually having lunch with him today. Yeah, cool. And um, but yeah, like to to walk out on the podium, Podium there that first time to do it with someone like yep. Craig, who's just a hero of Australian motorsport, mm. was definitely a um, was definitely special. But e- each one after that has been special for different reasons yeah, because sure. there's the challenges that you go through within the race week and the people that you get to work with, and the and sometimes you've gone in thinking we've probably got no chance this year, and you end up on there. Yeah, well, like in uh, 2017 with Scott Pye, um, we'd, we'd had a lot of problems through practice and yep. qualifying. We qualified 20th, yeah, and right, um, yeah. race morning it was the weather was looking really average and Scott was due to start the race and literally on the like when you leave the pits to go around to the grid you're on the grid for like 45 minutes for all the for all the sort of dignitaries to come out and it starts raining when we're out on the grid and uh, Robbie Starr our engineer he's like mate if it rains you're in for the start because this is the strategy that we want to do and I sort of hadn't really sort of prepped myself to to do the start of the race I'm like great 
it's the start of the race, it's raining, and now I'm being thrown in. And I was like, oh, well, look, like we're, we're it at 20. Is what it is, We've yeah. got nothing to lose. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, I think there was only like, I think there's only two co-drivers that started. So you're out there up against all the main guys, and, yep. you, and it's one of those tough ones. As a co-driver, it's not your job to win the race. Yeah. But it's certainly not your job to lose the yeah, race yeah, either. Yeah. So, so don't bin it. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to sort of you're trying to sort of balance that yep. sort of you're wanting to do the best job for the team yep. without looking like a moron at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And I remember like once the lights went out for for some strange reason, our thing was just really good in the wet. Yeah, right. It okay. was just like and I just kept like moving forward and um I think by the time I handed over to Scott, we'd started twentieth and we'd got through yep. to sixth. Um, and as the race went on, again, we didn't have probably the best car during the mid part of the day when the track dried out. Um, but towards the end of the race when Scott was in, um, the car just really came alive as the track rubbers up. Like yep. It's one of those things where at Bathurst, if you've got a really good car at the start of the race, yep. you're probably going to be in a bit of trouble because as the, as the day goes yeah, yeah. on, the track rubbers yeah. up and the, and the mm-hmm. conditions change, yep. um, the grip changes and everything. And we just kept motoring on forward and forward. And I remember just like 45 minutes to go and we're like a genuine podium contender. Oh, wow. And it's just like... We, we started twentieth. Yeah, like you, yeah. you shouldn't be able to. It's start one of those 20th. one of those races, isn't it? That it's it's an enduro, and it's yeah. it's you got to be to finish first. First, you got to finish exactly. And, so. and yeah, we ended up finishing second, not yeah. not uh, not too far behind the leader. And then the following year, we started nineteenth, yeah. and again we're on the grid, and we're like, oh, look, last year we started twentieth and we finished second, and we, and we all were just like, there's no way we can do that again two years in a row. And sure enough, we did, and we yeah. finished second again. So. It's one of those races where you've you, you've just got to be there at the end. You've yeah, got to yeah. stay out of trouble yep. during the day. Um, and look, anything is possible. You you do need a, a, a little bit of luck to go your way yeah, sure. as the day goes on. Um, problems with other cars and everything like that. Uh, I think both of those years we probably didn't have the fastest overall car. Yep. But as the day went on, we the guys did a great job and we kept improving the car and it got better and better. Yeah, and yeah. certainly in those last stints, Scott was just, he did a stellar job. And like, I remember uh, 2017, I think it was, he had this epic battle with Shane and yeah. Shane actually fired it off down through the chase because it had been raining and it was a bit damp offline. And Scott squeezed him, like Shane went for the for the yeah. look down the inside, Scott squeezed him over onto the onto the wetter part of the track and Shane's just fired it off big time. Like, wow. went off at a huge rate of knots. And again, like Scott was, Totally within his rights to sort of, there was no contact between yeah, yeah. the two. It was just, it was good hard run racing. Out of, run out of road. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I remember just sitting there, heart and mouth, thinking like, yeah. "Come on, let's just do this again." So yeah, look, Bathurst has been um, one of those really special places, and it's um, sure. well, good luck, good luck next week. Thank mate. you. So yeah, yeah, we'll be cheering for you. No worries. Let's go to a quick break. Uh, let's get a drink of water, guys, and we'll be back right after this. And welcome back. So we just had a quick break. And what was the uh, what we were mentioning? So about? The, the next thing I wanted to talk about is obviously you know um, a lot of the stuff I've noticed you've been doing these days is mentoring young drivers, particularly up through career cup and so on. And um, tell me a bit about that. Yeah, look, it's been um, it's been probably one of the more um, one of the, one of the biggest parts of my career that I'm really proud of. That um, it's you get to a certain point in life where you you want to be able to give back. You want to be able to help sure. others because I had a lot of so many people that helped me out in the early yep. part of my career. I wouldn't have done anywhere near of what what I have if it hadn't been for the people that helped me and mentored me along yep. the way and the support and everything like that. So to be able to sort of give back. So so I started with McElroy Racing back in 2013, yep. uh, racing in uh, Carrera Cup for them. Yep. Uh, but also part of the bigger part of my role with the team was to be able to sort of mentor a lot of the younger guys, but also some of the more gentleman drivers yeah, that, uh, yeah. that are customers of the and team And that's a well. big deal too, isn't yeah. it? You know, if you get proper training, some of the guys, if they, you know, a guy makes a lot of money, goes and buys a Porsche, That's and then right. and then he doesn't suddenly know how to drive. He might have done a few track days out in his Mercedes or something over the years, but yeah. that's a whole different animal, isn't it, getting into a racing car? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's probably one of the biggest things that these guys really struggle with is they've, they've maybe done a few track days and all yeah. that sort of stuff. But, like, for those gentlemen guys... When you, when you throw them out there into sort of the lion's den of proper actual racing yeah. where there's other guys out there. And, and they're racing against guys like themselves that are very successful business people. It would that, probably be easier to teach a kid who doesn't have any bad habits. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. And at least, like, a kid's usually come through go-karting. And, and that. they a listen lot, to you, yeah. yeah a, lot of, a lot of these gentleman drivers are coming straight from sort of Straight from the boardroom, straight yeah. into Carrera yeah, Cup. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and also, they probably not don't like being told what to do normally if they're successful well, <laughs> in life. You know, that's probably a true thing. So it's it's about trying to find the 
the way to be able to communicate yeah. with those guys and everyone's different from sort of some of the young yeah. guys and that that I've coached so there's been some great sort of uh, some young kids that I've been involved with over the years like so Matt Campbell who's now obviously a, oh, really? a, a Porsche factory driver so, so, you, you yeah, so he, up, yeah? he came to McElroy Racing in 2004 14 yep. um did GT3 challenge so yep. he he's really sort of he's done the whole sort of Porsche pyramid and and really sort of he's he he really sort of exemplifies what Porsche are trying to do with young kids in yeah, motorsport yeah, so right. he started in GT3 challenge um so his grandfather was involved with Morgan Park Raceway for a very really? long time yeah, and and again the family didn't have a lot of money but yep. they they backed him as much as they could to get him into GT3 challenge and then yep. through the help of McElroy Racing and some of the uh, gentlemen guys that yep. were involved with the team yep. they sort of they saw Matt as this young kid that was really enthusiastic and just wanted to race cars it wasn't That's awesome for him it wasn't about it's not about wanting to be a race car driver it's just wanting to drive race cars yeah, yeah, and yeah. and was just a great kid so very quickly um, they got a group of um, business people around him to sort of basically fund that early part of his career through uh, the latter part of GD3 Challenge then into Carrera Cup um, so in 15 and 16, obviously he won Carrera Cup here in 2016 in, yep. in dominant fashion. Yep. Um, went to Europe, went to the Porsche Junior shootout where it's basically the best Porsche Juniors from right around the world. Won that. Uh, did um, uh, Porsche Carrera Cup, oh, sorry, Porsche Super Cup. Yep. Um, the following year over Which there. That, that finished, follows the F1. Yeah, around, follows yep. F1, finished yep. third. Um, and then was picked up as a Porsche factory junior driver, and now he's a fully fledged awesome. uh, Porsche factory driver. And the yeah, the future is only getting brighter and brighter yeah. for him. He's done some amazing things, and um, and to and that, you were a big part of it by the well, sounds of it. I, I was a small part in those in those in early years picture. through yeah. sort of the yeah. through that sort of um, formation time through GT3 Challenge and Carrera Cup. And and look, I'm there to sort of give those guys some advice to to sort of help them. Um, along that journey to to help them in all aspects of not only about sort of in through practice qualifying racing like I'm on radio to those guys through the race and sometimes you when you're outside of the cars you can see things that when you're in the car in the heat of the moment and all that sort of stuff so um, and, and, and again each person is different that you're dealing with so yeah. some of those younger guys you can generally leave them alone but sort of it's like maybe in the latter part of the race two or three laps to go they're leading a race or something like that it's just being that sort of those words of wisdom in their ear, just to keep them that little bit relaxed, keep them that bit focused. Um, whereas some of the some of the more mature drivers, it's about trying to coach them through the whole race. It's trying to sort of keep them sharp because, yeah. again, for those guys like the Carrera Cup car, on a physical side of things, it's probably just as hot as the V8 supercar. Yeah, wow. So these guys that are used to being in a boardroom in a suit through the week, you throw them in a 60 plus degrees race car. You're in a gym. And, it's, uh, and, yeah. and yeah. Those, those guys, it, it's tough. So um, yeah, look, the, the coaching and mentoring I've done, and obviously we've had now Jackson Evans, who's gone on to become yeah. a Porsche junior and racing for Porsche over yep. there. Um, our latest um, recruit, Cooper Murray, is literally over there at the Porsche Junior Shootout as we speak. That's I was awesome. messaging him last night. Um, they're over there in Spain for the Porsche Junior Shootout at, as we're going on right now. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a really fulfilling part of my career and, and it's something that I really enjoy and it's um, something that I'll keep doing for, for many more years, yeah, even, even after I finish racing. And what's, yeah. a, what's, a, what's a piece of advice you give out as your 101 to, to a lot of these young drivers? Um, look, the big thing for me is enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination. Yeah. It's it's enjoy, like everyone, so many people, they're sort of, they're focused on, like if they're racing in a particular series now, it's like, oh, I've got to do well this year because I want to do that next year. It's, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about what the future's going to hold. Focus on what you're doing now yeah. and enjoy where you are now because there's no guarantee as to, mm. as to what tomorrow, let alone what next year is going to bring in life, let alone in motorsport. I, I, think, I think that's... It, the same in any sport where they just aspire to be an F1 driver yeah. and, I'm, and I'm going to get there and, yeah. and then the trouble is when you don't you sort of go oh well I failed well you yeah. didn't really fail you just no. you, you're just probably aiming for the stars and you sort of hit the moon yeah. But and as I say to people it's one of those things you you can only fail if you don't try that's right it's um like to, to get out there and actually do it um, you've already accomplished more than what most people ever have. Absolutely. And again, I, I look at myself and think as a kid, I just dreamt about racing at Bathurst in anything. Yeah, like yeah. I would have been happy to ride a push bike around there as a kid. Um, it was never about sort of wanting to 
um, race in the main race. And it's just go to Bathurst and actually yeah, race. Yeah. So I've got so many mates in motorsport that, again, they haven't done the big race, but they have actually raced at Bathurst, which yeah. is more than 99% of people sitting at home on their lounge. They yeah, look absolutely. at that and go, wow, imagine just racing at Bathurst. And I think, I think that's what's good about that challenge, Bathurst. It gives the average guy a couple of days up there to go. And, and you're not door-to-door, so you're probably, as, as long as you can keep it on the, on the pavement, yeah. you're probably going to come out unscathed. Yeah, ex- right. exactly. Like any chance to go to yeah, Bathurst. And sure. like you said, Challenge Bathurst, it's opened up the door to so many more people to I go and experience so, yeah. something that so few of us get to experience. And it's a bit of a test day for the Bathurst 12-hour too, isn't well, it's it? It's become a real good test day yeah. for the Bathurst 12-hour. <laughs> so now I'm going to get to what everyone wants to hear about. Yes. That little car called Nemo. Back in 2012, um, that car come along and it, it really changed the landscape of time attack cars worldwide Absolutely. and it set the precedent for what we – uh, enjoying today and um, you were the man that got to experience it first hand tell us all about that from the get go yeah look again it was one of those um, really weird s- scenarios that came about very last minute so uh, the guy that owned the car had had a whole bunch of different people sort of involved in the build he was process. a career cup racer from memory was he originally or? Um, he, he'd done some Porsche stuff but I think more at a, at a club okay, level but, okay. but yeah, he'd had a bunch of people <coughs> sort of involved in the build and people had ripped him off and there was mm. and, and it was just he was just struggling to find someone. Like he had this, he had this great vision. He had this great project, yep. but he just needed someone to finish it off with that had the expertise to be able to do yep. it. So he came along to McElroy Racing and spoke to Andy, and and he's like, "Look, I've got this car. We've got this event, and I think it was like three or four months before World Time Attack. Yeah. And this thing was still like a box of bits. Yeah. Like it was, it was probably eighty percent completed, but it just needed those finishing touches and all that sort of stuff. And I remember walking into the workshop and seeing it for the first time." And I was just like, my jaw hit the ground. Obviously, up till then, I'd driven the Lotus at World Time Attack and yeah. seen like the, the Cyber Evo and all that sort of stuff. And I, and I knew straight away this car had the potential to be something really I special. I could remember Andrew Brilliant telling me, this car, I can do this. I'm going, yeah, come on, bro. You sound like a, you sound like a big mouth American. But uh, let me tell you, in his defence, he was right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and he uh, knew what he was doing. And I remember saying to Andy, I, we were, I was in the workshop one Friday afternoon we're having a beer and uh, I said mate I want to drive that car and he's like well look the owner the owner thinks he's going to drive it he said but it's going to be well beyond him so so originally my involvement was to sort of basically to come along and and to coach him and to help him and everything like that so um, the first initial shakedown test that we did out at Queensland Raceway I sort of went out there just to basically I turned a few laps in it just to begin with just to go hand it back to him and go like the steering wheel's straight it doesn't vibrate the brakes work and go and have some fun. Yep. Um, we had some issues at that first sort of shakedown day, just some engine dramas and all that sort of stuff. Um, so quickly, another engine had to get built. And again, he his intention was going to World Time Attack, that he was going down there to drive it himself. And Andy was like, look, he said, no disrespect. He said, but with what this car's capable of, he said, I just don't think you're going to be able to get the best out of it. And he's like, look, why don't we send Warren down with you? He can be down there to coach you. Mm. And if you feel that you're not going to get the best out of it and you want him to step in, yep. then he, he'll he drive it for you. And I was like, yep, done, I'm sold. Um, so, uh, yeah, originally I came down to World Time Attack that first year with all my race gear but no real firm plan to drive. And um, and after the first sort of session, he was kind of like, yeah, look, he said, I think, I think it'll be best. He said, we've invested a lot of money. There's a lot of people that have had a lot of input to yep. this. We want to see the car do well. Um, so why don't you drive it? And that's basically how it all started. And so um, for a car that really didn't have the sort of development that a lot of the other cars yeah. had there, uh, and it didn't make big horsepower no, either. No, I know. I remember mm. the, it was a morning session Friday, and I'm go, it's going around. It didn't even look that fast. It, coming down the straight, it was slow. Yeah. Right? And I look at the thing, 125.1. You have got to be kidding. That's yeah. and like there was two seconds faster Leaps than everyone else back then. Yeah, yeah. Right. like I, I don't think we even cracked two sixty down the front straight. No. no, I don't think it did either. It was, it but, was, but it was well and truly pinned through turn one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it just it had the aero balance. Like Andrew, brilliant again, brilliant yep. by name, brilliant by nature. Yep. Um, had done a great job. The guys at McElroy, they just got a good enough setup in that you you had so much confidence. So and my next question: What do you think that could have done with a ton of power? Do you, do you think it would be? we have knocking on the door where they are now? or Look, I don't think it would be where sort of they are these days because, yep. again, that, that whole sort of aero side of things. It was 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's really taken another, yeah. another step yep. forward again. But I think to be sort of that pioneering car that really, I suppose, changed the it direction. Did. Worldwide. For, it's yeah, sort of for, right. for World Time Attack here and overseas. Yeah. So 
it was a, it was a cool project to be part of. Obviously, we came back the following year. Yep. Um, again, the car basically sat around for ten months between yep. Yep. between sort of 2012 and 2013. They had a new engine built up with a massive big turbo on it, but yep. literally from the moment we got there, there was mechanical problems. Yep. Uh, the engine didn't run right, and unfortunately, it ended up uh, ended up melting the engine. And there was a whole lot of controversy after that, which everyone's going to expect <laughs> us to go into, which we're not going to because it's none of our business. No <laughs> idea what you're talking about. So, so um, but it was certainly it was certainly a big part of the whole definitely. landscape change, and it was the pioneering yep. aero car in def- the world, pretty was, much. It was definitely know? one of the milestone moments yeah. of the event, and yep. especially Time Attack globally. That yeah. car really changed you know what people thought about aerodynamics and yeah and, you know, what you could actually do with with the time attack. well and, and that that was the first car that was ever designed around aero That's everything right. else had aero added to an existing thing so yeah, yeah. and like even in 2012 when we did that 25 one as i came out of um the hairpin after corporate hill so back then i think it was turn nine turn yep. eight these days as we came out of there, coming up the straight to, or coming up that short straight to come up onto the main straight, yep. it started blowing a huge amount of smoke into Did the it. cabin. And I'm like, this I'm thing. Die. Di- <laughs> I didn't think I was going to die, but I'm like, this thing's going to detonate itself. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it, I just need it to hold together for like another 300, yeah. 300 400 meters yeah. to get around. So I sort of short shifted a little bit up that straight and just took it a fraction easy and short shifted only like about 500 RPM yeah, yeah, down the straight. Yeah. But so on the dash, it was on for about like a 24.6. Wow. Um, wow. So we lost about half a second through yeah, that yeah. sort of last part of the lap. But look, I think with I think with decent horsepower and that exact aero setup, I reckon it was on for probably a low 23, high 22 back then. Yeah, wow. That's um, a, that, so is, that is like that's... The next fastest car back then was Tilton, which That's was right. they were at twenty seven back yeah, then. Yeah. So you know, and they've Costas, Costas progressed through the years. You know, he's right at the pointy end now, but yeah. he's gone back. But but what happened? Nemo come around the outside, and no one saw yeah. it coming. Exactly. Yeah. And suddenly it was here, and then everyone had to change their game. Yeah. They had, everyone had to change the way they thought about things, the way they did things. Yeah. Um, and, and, and particularly us, we had to put some more stringent rules in or we were, we were going to end up with a Formula One car with a fiberglass body on it turning yeah. up. And yeah. we were happy to do that for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you who said that to me. Alan Horsley said it. He yeah. said, well, we might build a Mazda with that. Yeah. You know? But surprisingly, like, it wasn't actually a very light car. Like, oh, the, the construction of it, it was, it was built as a, as a proper race car. Like, yeah, it, wasn't, okay. um, it wasn't just like a, a road car with yep. some light tubing sort of shoved in it, which we've seen over the years some yep. of those earlier cars at world time attack it was all about maximum horsepower yep. and really really lightweight yep. like nemo was definitely not a, a super light car yep. um but it was strong it was rigid it yep. did everything right so yeah it would have been great to see it with some horsepower but um hey it was anyway, all part of it wasn't ex- it exactly That's it was it. a great journey and this year the good news is if you're competing in world time attack the bloke that's probably going to come up in an interview is sitting right next to me. That's right. <laughs> Luffy's joining us on the broadcast crew this year, and it's awesome to have him there because you've sort of been there so many times. You've got such an intimate knowledge of the event, and, um, yeah, it's going to be awesome to have you. you, you you're, um, you're taking over George's job this year. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm excited to see what the cars are going to be able to yep. achieve this year. Obviously, last year... Uh, we all know what happened in the world with COVID and everything yeah, yeah. like that. So, uh, obviously, everyone's been away working hard on their cars to sort I of think come, so, yeah. to come back and obviously be able to beat the guys with the Porsche. And um, That's I know, their plan. I know, the, I know yeah. the Tilton guys have been working hard. And that um, car's gone really fast now. You yeah, know. yeah, I know. It's and it's been quick at Wakefield. Park and he as can well. that yes. Brad Shield has got to be one of the most underrated drivers in yeah. Australia. Like he is Absolutely. really quick. Yeah. Especially so in that it's car. it's going to be ex- exciting to see. Um, but in in all classes, like it's yeah. just every, everyone's had time to sort of think and prep their cars and and, and the club sprint now can run on the new AO 52 so it wouldn't surprise me um if we see club sprint in the mid 30s you know yeah. which is you think back you know that's right back in the day <laughs> yeah. lotus that's, would run that's, a that's what, that's what the v8 supercars used to run originally yeah. around there didn't they yeah i remember back starting in in supercars there i think qualifying when i first ran there with uh, the djr falcon was like a 33 or something yeah, like that yeah so yeah. so now we're into the 119s right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, it's been awesome having you on here, mate. And good luck at Bathurst next week. We'll be cheering That's on for it. you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, and everyone, thanks for listening to the World Time Attack Challenge Off The Record poss- the podcast made possible by all our incredible event sponsors and supporters. And of course, you, our World Time Attack Challenge fans, a reminder, World Time Attack Challenge is on 1st and 2nd April 2022. Get your tickets now from worldtimeattack.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can tune into this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. So thank you, everybody, and see you guys next time.